Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so first of all, I have to thank the organizer for having me here today. I mean, imagine, you know, I mean, I have never imagined myself standing on a stage in the SUV forum. Um, the, I'll tell you why later. Um, my uh, topic today is the clinical management of aging patients with HIV. I'm going to start with my disclosure. I do not have any relevant disclosure to this talk. And why? Because I'd like to declare myself first that although I am uh, an ID specialist and geriatrician, but I am super duper small in the field of HIV because my research, actually everything, is focused on the non-HIV. But anyway, I've got something to share with you today. So my talk today will be divided into two parts. The part one, I think it's gonna be really nice to know something about the changes in aging so that we have some basic and then we combine the HIV infection into aging later in part two. All right, we'll move on to part one. Here's the outline. I'm gonna briefly talk on the introduction in terms of aging. We'll touch on the biomarkers of aging. Uh, immunosenescence. We'll learn a lot actually from Professor Sabin. I like to get rid of my slides, but I've got no time. <laughs> and also, uh, with the changes in immune function associated with aging, and lastly, we'll end up with the aging with the overall infections. I mean, as we all know that we are in the aging society, it is true not only in the Western countries, in the U.S., but it is also true in Thailand. I mean, when you go up to the floor, uh, the regular wards in your own hospitals, I mean, we see that a lot of people are aged over 60, 65 years old, something like that. Um, according to a survey uh, from a couple of years ago, more than 8 million, uh, 800 million people worldwide age over 60 years old. And that particular number is actually four times higher than a survey back in 1950. When you live longer, it doesn't mean that you're gonna stay healthy forever. I mean, a lot of bad consequences can occur, starting from higher prevalences of infection, uh, cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, or even cardiovascular diseases. Some believe that I mean, all of those could have been affected by the a matter of changes from the immunity, I mean, either from the innate or uh, adaptive immunity. Um, and again, you know, I mean, when we grow older, I mean, a lot of people believe that we do have a, a condition called a decline in our immune system, or we call immunosenescence. We talk about that later. Just would like to recap with you a little bit. I mean, when we see the patients in the clinic, particularly when you see the elderly people, I mean, and besides taking a physical exam, a history and a physical exam, you may need to perform something we call physical function assessment on them as well. I mean, what are they? So basically, you need to look at their walking speed. You need to measure the grip strength. You need to analyze the chair stand because all of those can be indicators of the overall mortality among the patients. But if you will perform some blood tests on them, many times you can realize that they are in the state we call chronic inflammatory process. You're gonna see a slight elevation of the uh, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, for example, uh, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, or even CRP. Or if you can look at some simpler lab, like the vitamin D level, you know, I mean, the low vitamin D level can be another good predictor for neurocognitive impairment or even the overall mortality as well. And if you are a basic scientist, you would like to find more uh, about the root of, on the root of the problem. A telomere can be probably I mean, the way to, to answer the questions because telomere length can be another good explanation for um, the biomarkers of the aging because sometimes you know we can really predict the mortality from the telomere length. We'll talk about that later as well. All right, and what is immunosenescence? So basically, it is the aging of the immune system. What I've written here, that aging of the immune system is not necessarily linked to chronological age. So that means when you're old, it doesn't mean that you're gonna be so weak in terms of your immune response. Even when you are young, it doesn't mean that I mean, you are stronger than the older population, all right? This is a fact that we need to remember, we keep that in mind first. 
And what causes immunosenescence? I mean, we learned from Dr. or Professor Sabin already about the CMV. It's been long known that a CMV or the chronic inf infection from a virus CMV has, has been listed as, uh, as a cause of the immunosenescence. Apart from that, it could have been from the physical or psychological stresses, uh, chronological age, or even obesity as well. All of these can drive yourself into a, an immunosenescent state. And I touch on um, the telomere. I mean, and what is a central role actually for telomeres? So basically, I mean, if you imagine your chromosome as a shoelace, there are two ends of, you, uh, of the shoelace, right, right here. Probably you don't see that. But anyway, uh, it is just right there. All right, just imagine the cap. So the two legs actually are the places for a telomere. If you would like to have your chromosome intact without any damage from any environment, um, from anything, you need to have very long or good size of the caps, right? I mean, again, the telomere would do that job. And the enzyme telomerase is the enzyme that helps to lengthen the telomere. When you grow older, we we'll believe that the telomere, telomerase function is not going to work so properly. That means I mean, you tend to have shortening of the telomere when you grow older. There's a quotation stating that here, that the telomere is just like biological clock. As they shorten, the senescence can take place. Because I mean, we are in the environment that we have a lot of exposures around this. I mean, not just only from within, I mean, but also from outside. When we are in the sun, if we've been, we're exposed to the sunlight, we're exposed to the UV, or if from, even from the radiation. Or the stress from within, for example, right now I have a lot of stress talking and the HIV among the people like here. Um, the ROS or the reactive oxygen species can drop yourself into uh, a status of the, um, rip of the uh, DNA um, lesions. If we have a very good repair pathway or we have uh, an intact the telomere length, we probably can fix those, such, uh, those conditions. But if not, probably, I mean, the repair pathway is not going to work properly as well. And why do we care about immunosenescence? A lot of people believe that people with immunosenescence would have higher level of the pro-inflammatory cytokines. And that was believed as well that has been caused of the atherosclerosis, type 2 diabetes, or even Alzheimer's disease. Not just only that, because we are infectious disease. The infections can be higher as well in terms of their uh, incidence and prevalences, and the response to the vaccine can be reduced as well among those people. Or even cancer. You know, with persistent inflammation can increase the risk of cancer and its progression. Because, and then uh, what does immunosenescence look like? I mean, you may want to know about that. So when we grow old, Right here, you know? I mean, at some point, you know, we're gonna enter into a state called immunosenescence. And also with a lot of uh, comorbidities like endocrine function, diabetes, or neural uh, function, dysfunction, or cardiovascular disorder, all of these would coincide with the immunosenescence. And then it can lead you into a bad shape. I mean, you tend to get more infection, you tend to have uh, some sort of the cardiovascular conditions. The characters of the immunosenescence is like, you're gonna have a lower uh, naive CD4 T cell. You do not have a great ability of the immunosurveillance. If you do have a bad phenotype within yourself, for example, you do have CMV0 positivity along with the um, a ratio of CD4 to CD8 of less than one, all of these things would be bad combinations and drive yourself into these uh, very bad uh, consequences, infection, cancer, or even frailty. As I told you before, that immunosenescence, uh, it causes a lot of things. Uh, in terms of the innate immune response, I mean, it started from your skin and mucous membrane. Uh, the complement and the PMN function won't work so well as well in such condition. And not just, oops, sorry, no. Sorry. I go back.
All right. Now with adaptive immunity, you know, I mean, a lot of bad things can occur as well, uh, starting from T cell and KT cell. I mean, they don't work so well. Same thing on the cytokine production. I mean, everything would be distorted. So when things were bad just like that, you know, I mean, you can really imagine that, I mean, you tend to get more infection rates uh, when you compare to the younger population or I mean, people without immunosenescent state. Uh, you tend to have reduced clonal expansion of T cells specific for chronic viral infection, particularly CMV infection. Or even if you're going to vaccinate a person with immunosenescent state, I mean, you won't expect to have a great number of the animate production. Same thing, you know, with the skin and mucous membrane impairment, I mean, the slow wound healing, that is something that you would expect. So I think, I mean, that's going to be a very quick review on the changes uh, and the people with age. And then we move on to part two, which is the HIV infection and aging. It, uh, this is the outline. Um, we're going to go through it uh, shortly. It is also true, I mean, not just only, I mean, we see the uh, general population in our country who are older than 60, 65 years old, but people with HIV infection or AIDS diagnosis, uh, they're getting older as well. A quick survey from the U.S. back in two, uh, 2016, uh, the report that the uh, people who were diagnosed with HIV or AIDS diagnosis uh, more than 50% of them actually were uh, recorded to be older than 50 years old already. And I've seen many patients in my clinic actually right now, they are older than 50, even 60 years old. My oldest patient with HIV right now is 84. And we need to realize that, I mean, despite we do have a lot of medicinal regimens to treat them on the, the virus suppression, but somehow the, the life expectancies among people with HIV positives remain shorter when we compare to the HIV negative individuals. And partly could have been from the HANA or the non-AIDS condition. And we believe that the HANA occurs earlier and more frequently or even more aggressively in HIV negative individuals. We believe that, you know, I mean, people with HIV positive individuals that do have a condition called the elevation of the inflammation starting from cellular or dissoluble markers. And those changes actually we cannot really reverse, even though you're going to suppress the virus completely. That means you're gonna, if you're going to draw some, the blood from your own patients, you, re, you still can see the changes in the expression of the activation marker on T cells, or a lot of things, or even on the monocytes. We believe that I mean, the, with these changes, or the, this regulation could have been from the apoptosis or necrosis equilibrium that's, that's just been distorted of the innate cells. So massive immune activation may be the key to explain all of these changes. I mean, we talk about the ongoing HIV, the viral replication, or the gut microbial translocation, or even the a very important factor that Professor Simon had mentioned, which is the CMV co-infection that is very important, and also with the immune dysregulation or the immunosenescence. But we cannot really blame on just only the physical part, but we need to blame on the patient's behavior as well. If your patient is a smoker, if they drink liquor or something like that regularly, you know they tend to have more infection or inflammation ongoing. Uh, for example, people who smoke, they tend to have increased oxidative stress. If they drink uh, alcohol regularly, you mean they tend to have microbial translocation more often or even the, with the co-infection, CMV infection, all of these things can drive themselves into a chronic inflammatory state. We talk on the gut microbiome and also the role of microbiome and why, I mean, the microbiome uh, in HIV would be another thing to discuss or that it could have caused the chronic inflammation uh, inside the uh, circulation of the, of the patients. So basically with the HIV replication and at some point, you know, I mean, we have, we do have gut translocation all the time, not just like in the patient, but also in ourselves. But in those, uh, uh, in these uh, particular condition, when we have the gut microbial translocation, I mean, your body will need to tackle the pathogens, right? I mean, by bringing in the macrophage and dendritic cell to create the inflammation and try to stop the pathogen from, from invasion. 
So we're going to create odd inflammatory cytokines, the TNF alpha, interleukin 6, and IL 1 beta to create the inflammation. But we need to have more specific um, immune response, so we need to call T cells to get activated and proliferate. Eventually, when we live in this condition long enough, eventually your T cell will be exhausted. So, I mean, along with those conditions, you know, I mean, eventually your T cell will enter a state we call senescent T cell. So, plus with the inflammatory process ongoing, that means, I mean, eventually people propose that it can create a lot of conditions called the cardiovascular diseases, neurocognitive impairment, or even the metabolic disease. In summary, so with the microbial translocation, residual HIV viremia, and the co-infection of the CMV infection might be the, the answer to activate the monocyte and create the inflammation and eventually can cause serious non-AIDS events. Uh, that can be something that is very important for uh, the patient that uh, can have HANA conditions. Another thing, uh, the effects of aging and HIV infection, it is very nice review from this study uh, stating that if you're going to vaccinate a patient who is young and negative HIV serology, I mean, and they measure the antibody production. I mean, in this uh, population, actually, they can produce a lot more antibody when we compare to the older population with seropositive HIV. And they try to explain why uh, they found that finding. It could have been from the background, the immune activation among those population because I mean, they do have like B cells and T cells activated all the time. So, I mean, they do not have um, the way to make antibody correctly or properly when we compare it to the younger population without HIV positive, without HIV infection. It seems like I mean, immunology can explain a lot of things, but we do not know yet at this time that uh, it will be the answer for everything in aging HIV patients. But at least if we're going to tease out uh, by the immune category to compare, to make a comparison between HIV infection and aging, starting from the pro-inflammatory environment, we can see that they, they share a lot of similarities, starting from the pro-inflammatory environment, people with aging, and people with HIV infection. They do have increased level of the inf interleukin-6, TNF of uh, soluble CD14. They do have higher level of the coagulation factors or even acute phase reactants. Same thing that we can see in the monocyte part. You know, they have inflammatory CD14, CD16 on monocytes. They do not have a great uh, phagocytic function uh, in both entities. Same thing that we can see in dendritic cell and TLR pathway. But with the overall uh, interferon alpha production is much less in both uh, populations. And now, I think, I mean, we've talked about that already, this HIV accelerated aging. I mean, at this time, I'm going to say we don't know, but, I mean, we try to explain a lot of things, whether uh, it is the true uh, answer. But here, a lot of factors actually can affect the uh, aging among HIV population, starting from genetic instability, the telomere shortening from either from uh, HIV infection itself or from the aging process. And lastly, with cellular senescence would be something that is interesting nowadays. And of course, I mean, when we take care of the geriatric population without talking about frailty, it's not going to be a complete one. So frailty in geriatric population, it is another concern that we need to uh, discuss about. So frailty is the state of the increased vulnerability in old age, so they do not have a great reserve, so that's why I mean, they tend to be frail. So frailty is not equivalent to disability, why I'm saying that. So when you have a person, and if you like to make them disabled, just chop them limb out, and then that person will become disabled. But that it doesn't mean that that particular person would be frail, all right? So frail people, you know, they do not have a great response to the stressors. I mean, they cannot really react well, but disability or disabled people, 
who are not frail, they can respond to the stressor more properly. And with the frailty stage, you know, it can lead to a vicious cycle towards functional decline and other serious adverse health, health outcomes. And eventually, frail uh, people can turn into disabled later on in life as well. Um, the prevalence of frailty among geriatric population is quite high. Again, it is another survey in the US. If your patient is older than 85, the prevalence can be over 25%. We do not know yet in terms of the frailty prevalence among people who are aged with HIV patients in Thailand at this time yet. So that means, you know, I mean, the frailty is a very important issue to discuss among age uh, HIV population. So that means, you know, the functional status assessment is just very important uh, because the functional status is one of the predictors who tell the mortality among the patients. Um, because people can enter frailty state earlier than HIV negative stud, uh, patients. They can have a lot of higher burden of these psychosocial issues. Um, so in terms of taking care of the HIV patients who are aged, perhaps, I mean, to perform only the HIV routine care HIV might not be adequate. We perhaps need to uh, call the geriatrician or to have the way uh, of the geriatrician taking care of the patient combining into the HIV care. That is probably the way to go at this time. Um, I think I'm going to skip this one. All right. And a lot of comorbidities that we can see in HIV uh, disease, um, cardiovascular disease or metabolic conditions like diabetes, uh, pulmonary disease, uh, renal disease, bone disease, for example, osteoporosis, or even malignant disease. Uh, not just only from the physical part one as well, I mean, talking about the mental health. People who are aged, they tend to be more anxious than a uh, younger population. They can be depressed, sometimes for no reason, or, uh, and also with the medicines they've been using uh, as SRI for anxiety. And sometimes the prescriptions that you prescribe to the patient, for example, an easy medicine, FLVR, and sometimes it can create excessive aggressiveness in the patient, higher rate of the agitation, something like that, that you need to be aware of the signs side effects of the medicine prescribing as well. The cardiovascular diseases, uh, atherosclerosis, sometimes we believe that it is, um, it, it can occur uh, prematurely or it can occur faster when we compare to HIV negative individuals. So that means if you can uh, reverse or try to prevent the cardiovascular risk, you may need to be very thoroughly monitor your patient, uh, check the, uh, checking on the lipid profile maybe every three to six months or so. And you need to discuss with the patient if they are still smoking. You need to talk to them to not to smoke. And you need to manage the diabetes very nicely. I think in this slide you already know uh, what medications can cause hyperlipidemia. So just like to remind you that, I mean, with the medicines we are giving, uh, it might be another drive for the patient to enter atherosclerosis faster also process not only the TDF prescription, but also chronic immune activation, low vitamin D level, hypogonadism, or even the smoking can be additional risk on the patients. And immunosenescence versus the neuro uh, HIV, I think we learned about that already. It is not something that you're going to see early on in the disease. Uh, uh, of the infection, but if your patient enter into certain state, you do they do have um, a persistent chronic inflammation, neuroinflammation, something like that. I mean, they can enter into the neurocognitive impairment state at some point. So that means you know when you see the patients who are like older than 60, 65. I mean, taking care of them, uh, you're not going to ask them just only, okay, you take the medicine, how you're doing. You probably need to uh, ask them more, are you more forgetful, something like that? You need to perform the MMSE at some point, uh, at least to screen in their cognition uh, so that you know more about the patient, whether they are demented or writing. So, 
in terms of taking care of the aging uh, HIV positive patients, I'm going to say there's no uh, comprehensive or uh, of a complete, a complete formula uh, to take care of the patient, but perhaps you need to create your own treatment strategy depending on where you are. Um, but you need to really consider to combine the geriatric care into a routine HIV. So I think that's going to be the way to go. And you need to really consider the role of the multidisciplinary care. And if you do not know where to start, I'm going to recommend you to go read uh, more detail on the UCSF Silver Project. I think it is a very good uh, example for you to learn from. Drug drug interactions and not the issue that you need to discuss because you know, I mean, the elderly people they tend to take a lot of medicines on the list. Uh, polypharmacy occurs all the time. Um, Again, if you do not know or you, if you, you cannot remember all the metabolic pathway, it's very easy. Just go on to this, this website, check it, and then you know what to do on your, your, on your patients. So, and also another thing to discuss, the medication adherence. Um, when you take care of the uh, younger population or the adolescent uh, HIV positive individuals, I mean, you deal with a uh, different problem. They do not want to take the medicine. It's from, uh, um, from their life, uh, lifestyle. But when you take care of the elderly people, I mean, they do not take the medicine. It could have been from their depression or, I mean, they do not have uh, a, a good support. Uh, at, uh, from the family, something like that. They cannot see things clearly. Um, those limitations, something like that, you know, I mean, it can uh, stop them from uh, adhering to the medications or even drug abuse. I mean, if they drink uh, alcohol at home, all of those things can uh, stop themselves from uh, adhering to the medicine. So if you would like to enhance them to comply to the treatment, you know, I mean, you need to perhaps arrange the education class or session so that they know the uh, importance of taking medicine uh, to control the disease uh, to get well all the time. Um, if you can provide them the organizing devices, you know, the many times they're confused. They do not know which medicine to take at what time or which one to take at this time. You know, I mean, with it, when they have the list of medicine, like 10 or 15 uh, for one day taking. Um, reminder devices, I mean, you might want to suggest them that, okay, you need to have this device or you need to have some alarm uh, to take the medicine at a certain time. And try to get family members or caregivers involved, you know, so that you have more responsible people for uh, the patient. And I think I'm going to uh, stop my talk with the suggested management for new HIV, uh, especially when they're old. You know, I mean, besides taking care of them, like ta taking a comprehensive history and a physical exam, uh, routine blood test, checking on the CD4 cell count, you need to look for the fasting lipids and screen on the cardiovascular risk, uh, looking at the urine, check on their kidney function. Do not forget about the vaccination. Check on the uh, fasting glucose to screen for diabetes. And you need to discuss with them on the mammography, colonoscopy, or even lung cancer screening if they, uh, they do have the risk on, or even the abdominal aortic aneurysm if they are at risk. Um, so I think I'm going to stop here. So in summary, I'm going to say taking care of the uh, aging patients with HIV, it's going to be really nice to combine a geriatric care into a routine HIV care at this time. Thank you.